three pieces on this disc have been a long, long part of my life, long and big part of my life. Um, Prokofiev's first concerto was my debut with the Concertgebouw Orchestra way back. I was 19 years old and learned to be specially for this occasion and um, I've played it probably near to 100 times over the years. And um, that was the first of the three pieces I've played. Lark Ascending I've always listened to and thought that's beautiful, but I never had the op opportunity to, to play it a lot. I'll come back to it in a minute. And the Walton Viola Concerto um, came a little bit later. I started playing viola when I was 19. Um, but not that piece, it was Harold in Italy, was my very first piece. And Walton, I was probably early 20s when I played that for the first time. And Lark Ascending is probably 10 years ago, 15 years ago maybe that I played that first. But it's the same idea. The three pieces have the same build up. Um, the first piece that was written was actually the Lark Ascending in 14, 1914. In 1915 to 17, the first concerto by Prokofiev started to be composed. Um, it wasn't premiered until 1923, and um, Prokofiev then had a great admirer in Walton who based his viola concerto on this piece. The same build up, the same kind of theme. It's not a rising third, but a rising fourth. Um, it all starts very soft. It ends all very soft. All the three pieces are round in that sense. It's a cycle. cycle. If you want the cycle of life, that is what I find so, so beautiful. And it's not music that is necessarily built on effect and on look at me, I'm a violinist and I'm a soloist. It's all incredibly poetic. So that is why, you know, that I think the three pieces work well together. The Lark Ascending is an incredible, it's nearly like program music, like you can say Vivaldi was the first real composer that wrote this kind of, you know, film music nearly, nature involved. Lark Ascending, the Skylark, you can literally hear and see him rise and disappear again. And in a way, the Prokofiev and the Walter Concertos are exactly the same. The funny thing is, with the, the viola, I've, I fell into it. I mean, I've always liked it because it's dark. It's I've got a low voice. I like um, also to be part of the middle. I'm not necessarily a person that always wants to be having the first word in the world. I like to fit in as well. So in a way, the role of the viola in the chamber music or in, in the, the idiomatic material of music is very close to me. The, the fact that you, in a quartet, for example, you play the inner voice, you make the raisins in the cake, you're not the topping, you're actually the substantial inner part of the cake. And um, I was studying at the time in Salzburg with Chandor Weg, violin, normal violin, and was very close to the Hagen Quartet at the time. And Tabea Zimmermann was supposed to play with them and she got ill. And I bluffed my way and said, oh, I can play the viola. So, you know, can I borrow a viola? I didn't even possess a viola. So I borrowed the viola of the father of the Hagens. Quickly rewrote my part of the Mozart quintet in violin key because I uh, clef because I couldn't um, read the, at the time, couldn't read the viola clef and did the concert, which was for me such a jewel of an experience because I was like totally inexperienced in a way, but it was so, I felt so at home to be in that role. So immediately after that, I think two weeks later, I bought a viola and Probably two, three months later, I had my debut with Radio Phil and Edo de Waard with Harold in Italy in the Concertgebouw on viola. So basically, um, from 19 years on, I've played viola as well as violin, and I like combining it a lot together in one concert. I don't find it very difficult to switch. It's just a matter of, I believe, switching the button. Um, but, you know, people sometimes ask, would you like, what if you were to choose, what would you choose? And I always say, well, luckily I don't have to choose <laughs> because yeah, I would find it very hard. Of course, I love the violin. It was my first love and I've played it since I was six years old. 
and of course it's nice to shine and to be really up in the eternal snow and, and, and shine on the top of a violin. But that darkness and the fullness and the, the richness of a viola sound is very close to me. The technique is a little bit different. The viola is uh, less quick to respond, so you have to be a bit more careful to make it speak. Um, also, that is a matter of doing it. And I'm tall, I'm 180, so I can, you know, deal with a big instrument. It doesn't have to be close to the violin size. I've got a huge viola, so it's really a different instrument. And I've got the power because I'm tall and, and quite strong so it that's not a problem it's rather difficult to go back to violin because that is also minute and very precious so that is it's it's a way of being flexible and I love that flexibility I love to be not stuck in on one track in life I like to be diverse and to be versatile and, and I'm still very curious so. Years ago, probably again sort of 30 years ago, I did a masterclass with Andra Schiff. And I was very young, about the time I played Prokofiev for the first time. And he said, you know, the music is between the notes. And that really made me think. And it took me a few years to understand that really. Because of course there's the notes and the intervals and that is, sounds beautiful or it doesn't sound beautiful or there's a certain tension in the intervals. But the timing, that is what makes one person different from the next one because everybody times it differently and now i'm for example when i'm teaching and the kids they count their rests so that them and then they count i say no no it's not about the counting the music carries on in the rest the 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 the, the art is to carry the music over the rest over the silence because the music carries on in the silence and even when you have a soft ending there's still attention when you do it well. You can and you can hear the people holding their their breath in 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 the audiences, and it's difficult because it's much much easier to be loud and to just end with a bang or you know make a lot of noise. We can see it in the world nowadays, unfortunately, that the more noise you make, the more successful you become. But I think in the silence is an, an awful lot of power and uh, of strength, and hopefully will come back to that at some point and it's it's um, especially in music where it's all it comes in waves and and, and um, for example when you make a crescendo that is much much easier than to make a diminuendo because you of course you can go softer but then to keep the tension and that is exactly I think what Andra Schiff meant by the timing is between the notes Well, the idea was to produce, if you want, both concertos live um, for different reasons. Uh, first of all, of course, the financial reasons. Um, on the other hand, it's difficult to do a live concert because you have the pressure of the concert, plus on top the pressure of it has to be really good and good enough for a CD. But that is why we have two years in between. I'm a regular guest with the NDR uh, Orchestra in Hanover anyway. Two years ago, we've done the Walton. And that was two concerts and a patching session, and we hardly needed the patching session because you know you you want to do well, and the inspiration of an audience there is such a plus that you can find a lot of perfection what you need for the CD in the inspiration. So it's it's really amazing how it worked out. And with Prokofiev, of course, it was a different conductor. And um, I'd played with Andrew Menzi a few times uh, during the season to warm up. We warmed up in Melbourne and we warmed up in Oslo Philharmonic. And then we did the recording and it, it felt really like, yes, we're here now, we're doing it. And it was, again, that kind of experience. You, you concentrate, you know, exactly with a piece which you're playing for such a long time. You know exactly where the spots are. You have to be really, you know, careful and cautious and extra concentrated and the few things that happen in a concert which is nice but you don't want them on CD when a tone doesn't speak or when you just you know when somebody's coughing or a little mistake and that is why you have a patching to 
iron those little things out. But I, I am really, really happy that we did it this way. The Lark Ascending, we did in the studio recording because there was no opportunity with the same orchestra, different conductor. Um, but that is a piece that is very mellow and that is so dreamy and uh, in a way we didn't need the audience and it's only 15 minutes so it's uh, sort of that was uh, nice to do that in the studio it's very very delicate and you don't want any disturbance but those two concertos were absolutely live and you can hear it as well you hear the 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 the, the, the breathing of the audience <laughs> 